In this film we're going to be looking at programming locomotive decoders using the lengths set 100 and I'm going to be looking at the CVs of a locomotive decoder, the configurable variables. Now it's a big subject but in reality we only use tiny bits of it so the, the manufacturer is perhaps a little bit guilty of giving far too much information to start with. Um, they do tend to publish absolutely everything to do with the decoder, where in reality you're probably only going to be changing a couple of uh, parameters. Um, in most cases, when we install a decoder, we're changing the address, and then we may look at a couple of the CVs to change the, the speed and the performance of the logo. Um, it's just three steps rather than 30 pages of information, if you see what I mean. So we're going to have a look at some of the, the more important CVs, uh, and I'm referring mainly to lens decoders, although a lot of the information is standard across DCC. So we've got a Backman Loco, uh, it's an Ivert Atlantic, and I've fitted a Lent Silver 21 decoder to it. Now, as delivered, it runs on address 3, and these are the factory settings for the locomotive performance. It's a nice starter locomotive, there's nothing uh, too complicated on it, it's basically just uh, a motor. So I've transferred the locomotive onto a programming track, which I've wired into outputs P and Q on the back of the LZV100 here. And when you've installed a, a new decoder, it's quite often nice just to check it out in the safety of the, the programming track, just to make sure that there's no faults with the installation. There could be short circuits within the loco. So Lens have a handy uh, fault checker on CV30. So if we get to the handset here, press F and you can scroll around the menus until you get to programming for programming track. Enter, enter, and then scroll around until you see CV on the screen. If we press enter, I'm going to type in 30. Now have a quick read on that. Now CV30 records any problems like overheating or um, short circuits on the motor or the lighting circuits. Uh, so we want to see a value of zero there before we put the locomotive onto the main track and give it full power. Uh, the kind of faults that it might show, it might show a value of one there, which is a short on the, the lighting output. A value of 2 here is a short on the, the motor, why it's overheating on the motor. And 4 is um, a short circuit on the motor circuit. So if you do get values in there, it's worth stripping the loco down and checking there aren't any shorts that could damage the decoder. So it's a nice little error checker CV30 is. Uh, I think it's more or less unique to Lens, although it's possible that other manufacturers have fault codes, um, fault checkers in their registers. So the, the main CV that most people are going to use is CV1, so we'll go into programming tracks, right? CV1 and that is the short address of the locomotive, so it's a two-digit address. So, go into there. It's set on the factory default of three, so we're going to use part of the cab number there, so we'll use... we'll clear that and put in a value of 51 to give the locomotive an address of 51. So that's on there. Across to the main track. So you'll see on the dress three, obviously, it's not driving it. So if I go to locomotive 51 now, oops, 
does help if it's on the track. There we are. CV2 is one that I sometimes use and it is starting voltage for the motor. So let's read off CV2. So actually we're set quite low, we've got a value of 1 out of a possible range of uh, 255 I think. I'll look at the manual. Um, so starting voltage is the voltage applied to the motor at the very first speed step when you're controlling it. So we'll see that the locomotive is sort of pushing forward. It's not actually all that smooth. You can actually almost see it stepping, which is where it's going between the poles of the motor. might find at a higher voltage it will run smoother so if we go to the programming track quickly go into CV2 and what I'll do is try a value of 4 So the initial voltage to the motor will be higher. So first speed step. Oops. It's a little bit smoother. We could actually go a little bit further. bit of a fishing exercise with some of these CVs, it comes down to personal taste on the end result. So now the first speed step is putting a little bit more voltage in and the, the loco is sort of running off faster on the lowest speed. If you put the setting too high then of course the loco may just sort of shoot off down the track on the first step. The next CV is CV3 and that sets up the inertia for acceleration or they call it acceleration delay. So on my controller if I quickly ramp up the speed the loco will actually accelerate quite rapidly. So what we want to do is to put some inertia in, at the end of the day it would have been a heavy loco and it would have taken quite a lot of effort to get up to speed so read CB3 got a value of 6, if we clear that let's put it to 100 so that's quite a high inertia you should have brought a track a uh, railer unit. Right, here we are. So we're going to ramp the throttle right up. Oops, forward. So we're at maximum speed on the throttle. And see, the loco is only accelerating very gradually. Eventually it will get up to maximum speed, um, it could take some time. To illustrate the point more clearly I've put the low on some rollers, so we'll ramp up the throttle. And with that quite high inertia it will take a bit of time for her to accelerate up to the, the maximum speed setting. Mm. 
I maybe should have used the lower value, but we're getting there. I thought we are starting to get close, so I'll cut her off. And we'll look at CV number four, which is the braking delay. So you saw that that stopped quite rapidly when I ramped the throttle down. So we'll read CV4. So that's a value of 5. Let's clear that and put in a value of 25. Okay. So ramp it up and you can see that acceleration delay. And then the deceleration delay, once we've got up to a little bit of speed now, we'll ramp the throttle all the way back down to zero. And deceleration delay means that it takes an awful lot longer to stop. With both acceleration and deceleration, it's worth having the locos consistent with the size of the layout that they're on. Um, if you've got 30 feet to accelerate your loco, um, then yeah, by all means, put a lot of inertia on it. However, if you've got quite tight sidings, you don't want it slamming into the buffers because it takes 400 yards to stop. So it's worth just sort of taking into account other factors there. What I've done is quickly set those values of CV3 and CV4 back to the factory defaults. So you'll see we're back up to quite rapid acceleration. We've got a very high top speed and quite a rapid deceleration again. So this sets me up quite nicely for the next uh, CV, which is CV5. CV5 is maximum speed. So if we go into there, program CV5. So it's showing 254 on the thing. Let's take our maximum speed down to 80. So we've cut it down by quite a proportion. So back on the rollers, so if we accelerate to maximum speed, You're, we're there now, so that's the maximum speed I've set on the decoder. So what that's doing is limiting the, the voltage to the, the motor. And we've set the top speed quite modestly. CV6 is the medium speed. So a locomotive decoder will take the value of CV2, the minimum speed, and the value of CV5, the maximum speed, and it will use CV6 to produce a speed curve, an acceleration curve. So a heavy freight train, you'd want the acceleration to be quite slow. Um, on a high-speed express train, the acceleration, initial acceleration would be quite rapid. So the value of CV6 will sort of determine that. So we'll just quickly look at the factory setting. I've reset CV5 to the maximum, so we will go up to quite a high top speed. And then come down again. And it uses the speed curve to go up and down. So we'll just read CV6. The value there about 48. So if I change that to quite a high value, let's clear that and put in value of 200. Oops. Try again. And we'll see what effect that has on the running. So we'll ramp it up to maximum speed. And we're very quickly up to maximum. So we come down through the speed steps, you see it's maintaining quite a high speed. 
now we're slowing off so CV6 and we'll put it to a value of say 10 let's have a look see what happens the opposite extreme so we'll watch and see what effect that has so if we accelerate up you'll find that we're, we're maintaining quite a low speed even though I'm increasing the throttle and eventually we're now getting up to the high speed so again right so I'll explain with the diagram so with a high value of CV6 so this is our maximum speed up here high value of CV6 you accelerate like that your speed steps go that way with the low value of CV6 we accelerate like this um, I generally aim, particularly with sound locos, to put CV6 at half the value of CV5 so that we get a nice straight line. Well, if I used a ruler, it would be a nice straight line speed curve. There are also such things as user-defined speed curves. Um, if you do like your programming and you if you want to put S-shaped, more realistic S-shaped speed curves in, then you can go in and actually tell the decoder what speed at what speed step. Um, we'll leave that for the more um, adventurous. Just out of interest, CV67 through to CV94 is the user-defined uh, speed curve. CV8 is the manufacturer's ID, so CV8, and Lentz decoders, the value is 99, that's the manufacturer ID assigned to Lentz. Um, something else you can do in CV8 is a decoder reset. So if we CV8 equals 33, we'll reset the decoder to factory settings. You'll find now that your address has returned to 3. So, oops, clear that and put in 51. So far all of the CVs we've looked at have been expressed as a decimal value, so something like speed, you know, it's a range between 1 and 255 um, acceleration falls into the same sort of rules. CV29 is a main configuration CV and it is actually composed of eight different uh, switches effectively. So if we read CV29, that's the decimal value that we've been using so far with CVs. To be fair, the actual bits down here, the numbers down here, show more about CV29. So if I turn bit 1 on, I will reverse the direction of the motor. So if you find a loco is running in the wrong direction, you can turn bit 1 on. Bit 2, which on the Lens decoders is now on as a standard, Bit 2 controls um, the speed step selection. So if you turn Bit 2 off, the loco will run on 14 speed steps, which is an older format and sometimes I use it uh, when I've got customers with older systems. But to be fair, Bit 2 is on all the time now. Bit 3 allows you to turn off the analog signal recognition. So with 3 off, the loco will only run on DCC. Turn 3 on and the loco will run on DCC. But if you take it to another layout, you can actually run it on DC. Bit 4 
turns on and off the Railcom signal, so at the moment Railcom is on on that decoder. If you're going to use a user-defined speed curve, then you turn bit 5 on. But otherwise, with bit 5 off, it's using the speed curve from CB2, 3 and 5, uh, 2, 5 and 6, sorry. Bit 6 allows long addressing. So in CV1, I showed you how to give the locomotive a two-digit address. Well, you'll notice that all the values can only go up to 255. So CV1 is actually limited to 100 or 99. So you can only get two digits into it. If you want to create a four-digit address, what it does is split it over CV17 and 18. So with bit 6 on, it's telling it to look at CV17 and 18 rather than at CV1 for the address. Okay, so CV29 really is for sorting out issues. Um, we don't use it that regularly. Another useful thing on the lens controller is the decoder reset um, for lens decoders. So if we go down here and press that, what it will do is reset a whole load of CVs and reset the decoder back to manufacturer settings. So if you've tinkered around with CVs and the result hasn't been as you imagined, you can always set it all back to factory settings there. You can also use CV8 equals 33 to do that. You will find that it will be back to address 3. So it won't read the address. We're back on 3. This next bit is really just for sort of information only. Um, the observant of you may have noticed the bits lighting up on my uh, all of the CVs while I was working on them. So if we look at CV number 5, value of 254, and these are the bits across the bottom. There are 8 bits to every CV, and think of them as 8 different switches, each with different values. So if we turn all of these off, so the bits are binary, so everything off equals 0. Bit 1 has a value of 1. Bit 2 has a value of 2, 3 is 4, 5 is 8, 4 is 8, sorry, 5 is 16, 6 is 32, 7 is 64, and 8 is 128. Um, so with just 8 switches, we can produce 256 different values. And importantly, no two combinations of switches can produce the same value. So, it's a nice little cheat for compressing information. And it allows the decoder to store an awful lot of information in the same way as it allows a PC with 64 bits to, uh, to store a massive amount of information. The nice thing with how Lentz lay out their decoder programming is it shows both the bits and the decimal value. So the majority of times people are using the decimal value. So we can just clear that and type in what we want it to be. So say 230. And it will work out which bits it needs to turn on to get that decimal value. Alternatively, we can actually adjust it using the bits. So if we turn out some bits, we get a different result and we can send that. I've just set my maximum speed as 38, which is probably a bit ill-advised. So I'm going to clear that and put it back to 254, which is what it was originally. Um, hopefully that will be of some use and it will start to make sense of some of the instruction manuals that people uh, will see.